Let us pray. Our Father's God, to thee, author of liberty, to thee we pray. Long may our land be bright with freedom's holy light. Protect us by thy might, great God, our King. Amen. 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 Please be seated. Reflecting on today's sermon for Independence Day, I kept coming back to one word, gratitude. Specifically, I was filled with gratitude for the abundant blessings which God has poured upon us with the freedoms we enjoy here in the United States of America, particularly as Christians with the totally undeserved privilege of worshiping in this country in the 21st century. For all of our complaints about the current state of affairs, though justified as they may be, in America we still enjoy an unparalleled freedom of worship. Worship to the triune God, which is utterly unique to the Christian experience throughout time and space and even across the world today. Most everywhere else around the world, Christians risk their livelihoods, their families, and especially their lives to gather together, as we are, to worship the risen Christ. And the same holds true for Christians going back to the first century, where it was so commonplace in the Christian experience to see death at the hands of of the Roman Empire, that martyrdom, death in the Colosseum, was not an exception, but considered the rule of Christian life. So I am thankful. I'm thankful for the liberty by which Christ makes us free, and for the liberties we enjoy as Christians today in 21st century America for as long as God sees fit to do so. I was talking with my wife about our gradual hymn earlier today, My Country, Tis of Thee, and we reminisced about how in first grade we would sing this song every single day after the national anthem. Excuse me, after the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem would be another thing entirely. Every day in public elementary school. Now, I don't know if this is still done today, but I would be surprised. It certainly, I wouldn't expect to see it done in very many schools. But I remember how, if you listened to it a certain way, this is kind of funny being in first grade, if you listened to it a certain way, the words, of the I sing, sounded like, of the icing. (laughs) Like you were singing about icing on the cake or something. It was funny to think that we were singing about such things, but more to the point, again, the idea of children singing this song in public schools today sounds totally antiquated in a time when it is much more popular to teach the next generation to hate the country they live in, as opposed to take pride in it. You reap what you sow, of course. And two decades later, we see the fruits of a generation taught to hate their country while simultaneously enjoying the highest standard of living in all of human history. If we were to survey the country tomorrow, if we were to go around to every parade and cookout in the nation, I would wager that nearly half at least would not know the purpose of Independence Day or would in some way reject the idea of celebrating it altogether in some way, shape, or form. I want us to examine the idea of liberty today because the right or wrong understanding of the word cuts right to the heart of that national divide. And most importantly, it is true liberty which beckons to us as the reward at the heart of the gospel. Tomorrow, 
what millions will celebrate as an occasion to go to parades and cookouts and drink all day long, was born as a commemoration of the ratification of the Declaration of Independence by the Second Continental Congress on July 4th, 1776. Authored by, who are known as the Committee of Five, but primarily authored by Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence was, in a real sense, the brainchild of John Adams, who insisted and lobbied for Jefferson to be the primary author of that first draft. From the Declaration, we have that famous phrase, which we all know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There's that word again, liberty. Everyone agrees that liberty is a good thing, left, right, and center, but the true meaning of liberty has been tragically lost in our modern age. And the only thing that can revive it, the only thing that can sustain it, is the Christian faith. Only Christianity has the ability to reclaim the true meaning of liberty, just as the virtues of Christianity planted the seeds of Western civilization. What is the popular definition of liberty? Well, I'm sure you can guess. I'm free to do whatever I want. It's a free country, man. What is commonly understood and fought for as liberty today is, in fact, libertinism. A libertine is a person devoid of most moral principles, a sense of responsibility or sexual restraints, which are seen as unnecessary or undesirable. Sound familiar? Especially someone who ignores or even spurns accepted morals and forms of behavior sanctified by the larger society. Interestingly, John Calvin first coined the term libertine as an insult describing those who opposed his austere religious government in Geneva, Switzerland. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> by the French Revolution, the word was used widely, uh, as we understand it today, to describe those who lived hedonistic lifestyles. In other words, our modern American popular definition of liberty is merely extreme hedonism, the pursuit of pleasure as the ultimate goal of one's life. St. Paul gives us a different definition of liberty. In his letter to the Galatians, he writes, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself up for me. Christ freely and willingly gave his life, a perfect offering for the sins of the whole world, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Christ's saving work was rooted in love, freely chosen, and lived out in willing sacrifice. Therefore, true liberty is only possible in a spirit of love, and it comes with responsibility. As many of you know, I love this quote, quoted it many times from the venerable Archbishop Fulton J. Sheehan, who says, Freedom does not mean that we have the right to do whatever we please, but rather to do as we ought. The right to do whatever we please reduces freedom to a physical power and forgets that freedom is a moral power. Freedom, and here I would add liberty, is not the right to do what we please, but the right to do as we ought. When we are left alone to do as we please, what happens is we become slaves to our own personal pleasures. We are caught chasing the next high, the next season, the next television show, the next sports game, the next political election, the next great restaurant. As Paul writes in Romans 6, we are 
either slaves to sin or slaves to righteousness. He reminds us, For just as you presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. When we put our faith in Christ, we are set free from slavery to sin and death, our chains loosened by the power of love. There is no true liberty apart from this. Christ freely laid down his life for us, and we are all free to choose him. This is how God preserves our free will, through true love. A husband is not forced to love his wife. He chooses her, and vice versa. A loving parent is not forced to love his or her child. That love is a choice. And God the Father was not forced to offer up his only begotten son on the cross to give us eternal life. Christ freely chose to die for us out of love. And now we are free to put our faith in him, not forced to love him. True liberty is born out of true love, a love which is only found in Christianity. We must consider John Adams once more. Not to be confused with the Declaration of Independence, John Adams famously had this to say about the United States Constitution. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. Why does the meaning of liberty cut to the heart of our national divide? Because the United States is no longer a moral and religious people. The stats speak for themselves. In a recent Gallup poll this past June, it was noted that Americans' belief in God this year dipped to an all-time low of 81%, down from 92% in 2011. That is over 10-point swing in a span of about a decade. And I would argue that percentage is probably lower. What we are seeing is the percentage of people who think they are supposed to answer the question in the affirmative are no longer bound to do so. But I rest my case. John Adams' statement holds true if indeed true liberty is only found in Christ. And if a civilization collectively turns its back away from Christ, away from the God of the Bible, then what is left? Only the desperate pursuit of pleasure. It therefore makes perfect sense that an increasingly godless people is struggling against a constitution which, frankly, was not designed to work the way they want it to. It was not designed for this type of people in this time and place. An interesting thing to consider. For anyone who loves this country, it is both heartbreaking and frustrating to see the fabric of our society unravel before our very eyes. It's like watching a car wreck in slow motion and in fast motion sometimes. We are watching the toppling of a delicate relationship coined by Os Guinness as the golden triangle of freedom. Os Guinness is an English author and social critic, a member, as a matter of fact, of the Anglican Church in North America, who describes freedom, virtue, and faith as being dependent upon one another to survive. Freedom requires virtue, virtue requires faith, and faith, in turn, requires freedom. In other words, a society without virtue or faith cannot remain a free society. And once a society loses that freedom, it becomes much harder, if not impossible, to reestablish that freedom. 
Our country is fractured because we have given ourselves over to love of self. Whereas Christ teaches us true liberty is to deny oneself, to pick up our cross, and to follow him. The spirit of Christian love is the only way to make sense of today's gospel reading. But I say to you, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. Tell me, does American political discourse embody this statement, loving one's enemies? Keep in mind, the political debate includes we Christians as well. How often, and I ask this of myself, how often do you pray for those politicians and people on the other side of the political aisle. Here's another question we should think long and hard about. In the dark corners of your heart, how often have you hoped that perhaps something might bad, something bad might happen to a political opponent? Would we feel bad if such things were to occur? Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. If we refuse this duty, we are not motivated by the love of Christ. This is the only way in which we can perpetuate a truly free society. Again, freedom requires responsibility, just as love requires sacrifice. It is a sacrifice to love those who hate you. And indeed, more and more people will hate us as Christians. It is a sacrifice of pride, a sacrifice of the moral high ground. Love requires sacrifice of all this and more. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The cost of freedom is high because the cost of love is high. Our fathers before us laid down their lives so we can enjoy the freedoms we have today as Christians and non-Christians alike. Not many of my generation and younger feel the need to sacrifice anything at all today. And so we must pray for hearts and minds to be changed. We have much to ponder and pray for this Independence Day just as we have much to be grateful for. We also have much which rightly concerns us. But if you remember nothing else, remember that our first allegiance is not to the flag, it's not to the United States of America. Our first allegiance is to Jesus Christ. Moreover, this, this country is not our home. Do not let politics rob you of your joy in Christ. Our second reading from Hebrews describes our forefathers of the faith as strangers and exiles on the earth. Indeed, by faith, Abraham went to live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. As much as we take pride in our own country, as much as it was designed and built by godly men, it was designed by men and it is run by men. Indeed, God had a hand in establishing this nation, but we will not experience life in a perfect nation until we reach that heavenly city whose designer and builder is God. So our forefathers were strangers and exiles on the earth, just as we are strangers and exiles. And the author goes on, For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. We are but strangers and exiles who also happen to live in the freest 
most prosperous, most powerful nation in all of human history. But our desire for a better country reflects our innermost desire for that heavenly country, a place where God is recognized and worshipped as awesome, as perfect. Our God who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves a sojourner, giving him food and clothing. All of these desires which are currently and presently warped and twisted for our own personal and political gain, made perfect and executed perfectly by the living, eternal, triune God. And because we have been promised that heavenly country, we are free to sacrificially love our neighbor, praying and doing all we can to steward the gifts God has given us in this nation to the next generation, that they too may enjoy these same freedoms and above all, the liberty of Christ's redeeming love. Let us pray. God of our fathers, refresh thy people on their toilsome way. Lead us from night to never-ending day. Fill all our lives with love and grace divine, and glory, laud, and praise be ever thine. Amen. Amen.